having a lot of options. You need to, I mean, we're selling something which is fairly low cost, so it can't be too complex to sell. You can't sort of offer the, the, the tons of choices. You need to make it very simple, very straightforward. So it's, it, we had a very simple sort of we buy basic or some middle tier or the, the big tier, and that's the whole choice you get. There's no, not a menu of, of different options here. Uh, and we added, uh, already from 2005, we added uh, commercial components or closed source components. So you get the, the free and open source version uh, in, in the commercial packaging and there are commercial add-ons. And I'll show you a picture of how that looks in the end. Uh, the model seems to work. The model stays today. Yes. Pretty much the same model as we, as we came up with in, in 2005. Uh, as I said, there's an open source core and then there's commercial only value add around that. <clears throat> and we're adding more and more as we, as we move forward. And this is how we present our offering today uh, to customers. Um, we, we want them to buy MySQL Enterprise Edition which offers the highest level of MySQL scalability, security, uptime. So you see in the center here of the pie, or the half donut, or whatever, uh, there's the MySQL core, which is the free and open source uh, version of MySQL. But over the years, we've added more and more to the circle uh, on the outside, which are the, the value adds. Uh, of course, in the center is the support side of things, which have always been there. Uh, the MySQL Enterprise Monitor and Query Analyzer you see on the side there is, is, is uh, uh, another one which has been there uh, for a long time, MySQL Workbench uh, also, but the other ones have come uh, later. And the balance that we've always had to sort of strike here is, is what do we put in the center and add there and what do we put outside there? Uh, because uh, at the same time, we want to grow adoption of the core product. We want it to stay relevant, stay uh, uh, sort of towards competitors and stay, stay competitive and so on. So we don't want to put too much on the outside. And so there's a balance there that we have to strike every day. And, and still today, I would say that 90% of our investments in terms of engineering goes into the central pie here. And only a, a very small portion goes into the, to the external part there. We are constantly, I would say, threatened or, or, or uh, I mean, there are always new players coming in, offering something new around data management. Uh, today, often also open source alternatives uh, that are trying to uh, make a case that they have a better solution than, than ours. So uh, we constantly have to improve uh, our open source offering there. So I, just a few comments here, because I know, I don't know if it's been sort of a, a topic coming anybody here, but there's some FUD going around out there around Oracle and MySQL, so I just want to make a few comments on that. Oracle has never uh, closed source anything from MySQL. Uh, Oracle is committed to keeping the core of the MySQL open source. Uh, Oracle believes strongly uh, uh, in MySQL as a product. Uh, uh, I mean, Edward Scraven is my manager. He reports up to Larry Ellison, and he tells me every time he steps into a room with Larry, it's, it's always the same question. How, how is MySQL going? How are we doing there? So it's really something that, that's interesting uh, to the top management at, 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 at Oracle. They, they believe strongly in the product. Uh, just to take a number, I mean, 70% of Oracle customers are also at the same time alongside with their existing uh, Oracle products. They are also using MySQL today. And, and because it just provides the best solution for them for that problem. I mean, we see MySQL solving uh, particular problems uh, for these. Uh, uh, there's always this question around, oh, should I go with the Oracle database? Should I go with MySQL? And it really looks like uh, it, it, uh, they complement each other very well. Oracle is increasing its investment in MySQL year over year. But I want to state this clarity. I mean, Oracle and, and most other companies, they are not a charity. The investments that we make, they must generate then revenue in the end, and be it MySQL, open source, or any other project. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? Um, so I'm getting a uh, move on here, so I should sort of finish up. Um, touching just on the LAMP stack, uh, and then I can tie that in uh, with... we got about one minute. 
yeah. Yeah, so LAMP happened in the early web area, uh, e e era. Uh, there was a stack which became very popular, and MySQL was part of that stack. And if I should single out one thing that made MySQL successful was that it just became the de facto standard for how you build a web app. And in the end, uh, that powered big companies or big success stories around Google, Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, Amazon, Booking, they all built around MySQL in the early days. And it just allowed them to, with a very low investment, get started quickly. Uh, and, and, and that was one of the things that interested them. And, and I think the, the natural next step of that is what Mark was mentioning around the cloud. It takes that a step further. Uh, they still had to make the investment in IT or in the actual computers, but then they could get like a free stack on top of that. Uh, the, the cloud really allows these startups to get going even cheaper than back in the days with a very, 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 very low cost. So I had a few more slides, but I'll finish there. And thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're going to open up into the kind of uh, discussion part for a few minutes here. Uh, what's, I think, interesting to take away is that, quite simply, open innovation has great potential. Uh, investment in this area does have returns that are felt by companies, and companies understanding this are even willing to take steps to evolve their IPR strategy to ensure that they can maximize their potential returns. The question for us, however, is why do we care? Uh, so, what does open innovation actually mean for the European ICT market more specifically? And trying to get a feel for this umbrella term, open innovation, which covers open standards, open source, open data, open access. The talks just now illustrated, I think, something worthwhile that a lot of the positive examples are based on open source, and a lot of the challenge discussions that we already mentioned are based on open standards. Why are we talking about open innovation? Why do we have that big umbrella? Why do we bring in these things? So, uh, panelists, you gave us some great examples of how open innovation is being understood by companies, how IPR is being changed. In Europe, why should we do anything special about this if you're already doing it on the business side? And uh, basically, what should we do? Throwing it open to the panel, would anyone like to step forward and say a word? Lots of terrified faces. I think, Keith. I think Mike's comment earlier where he, where he was talking about how Jim Whitehurst characterizes contextual innovation, which is the, the comment from Tim Riley. Riley, the, the whole notion that we're creating a context and industry creates that context and is participating by collaborating openly, not just pan-European, but uh, again, through networks around the world. Uh, but government, I think, has a role in supporting the creation of that context, whether it's getting out of the way, which maybe ties to some of Andy's comments uh, from the first panel, or enabling by creating tax incentives, by creating benefits for, for collaboration and for openness, and setting an example through their IT spend to be able to support open platforms where they can advance and experiment and grow technologies. And so I think all those things are tied together, and, and, uh, and it starts really with you know, their investment in universities and how we educate, train, and socialize people to think about uh, participating. I think it's not a big problem right now, but it's probably a problem. It's, it's, an, it's an issue if we try to constrain and put people into a model of how we used to educate. Now the things have changed so that this open model, uh, people are bouncing ideas off of each other, and we're moved away from the whole notion of one to many, where it's, a, it's harder for professors and teachers now to participate because you've got people who are very informed and they want to learn in a nonlinear way, which is really the best way to learn. Uh, because ch issues and challenges that we face in, in life and in industry don't lend themselves to a script that you might learn in a, in a class on, if you're in business school, on taxation or on strategy. All these things are mixed together and we're forced to face them all at the same time. And so as we learn, as we grow, as we educate, we're creating a generation of people through government support largely, particularly in Europe, 
that, uh, that we have to be very mindful of because we're, that's part of the original context for innovation in, in society. A good point. And, you know, that's uh, kind of a question, you know, it touches on a question that we, we sort of need to address. How do we maximize this opportunity for Europe? How does Europe become a leader in something like open innovation? Um, would anyone else like to comment? I, I see that uh, Mark has grabbed a microphone there. Uh, it's already on, I think. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think... I think governments around the world are wrestling with this issue of how do how do they be leaders? Okay, I mean, there's obviously political pressure. There are other dynamics underway that that force that question. Um, I, I think it's hard. I think to get beyond the political dynamics of that, I actually think the more successful government leaders are not going to be constrained by that question. I, I think, as Keith said, I think the more successful government leaders are going to say, "How can my economy?" And I use that term because it's not just government, it's not just the private sector, it's the community in which that growth and those jobs and those new businesses are developed. How are we engaging in the global marketplace to get the best ideas, to benefit from the best ideas, to reorient our skills training, which I think is a problem across the world, across the developed economies, about reorienting our skills training to the future of technology, not a retrospective look about how we're going to train people uh, for technologies that are probably not even going to be around five or ten years from now. And how do we reorient our system to think about the future? Um, as I think about it, I actually think an area that is ripe for opportunity is actually the area of big data. Um, for those of you who have not gotten into the issue of big data, I, I encourage you to learn about it to understand it better. Open source and open data are inherent to big data and what is going on right now. Um, there has been, in my humble opinion, no better greenfield opportunity for innovation, new startups, new technologies, the new entrepreneurs to think about how better to provide and benefit from that enormous wealth of information and the increasing demand by people to understand, analyze, and manage it. In this disclosure, Red Hat made an investment into Gluster. Uh, we depend on Gluster FS, the open source project. Um, we by no means believe that it is you know, going to be the only thing out there. It, but we have decided that that is an important next step in carrying forward our open source mission and our open source culture. But we see a lot of stuff going on out there. And I think that's a very big area where there could be a lot of creativity uh, and, and a lot of opportunity for developing those new technologies, those new businesses, and those new jobs uh, that everyone is so uh, def definitely focused on right now. Thank you, Mark. And I just noticed we had one question from the audience, the gentleman in the blue blazer.